This is a uh, jack-o'-lantern that illustrates a story called um, Orlando Furioso, which was a Renaissance Italian epic about the Knights of Charlemagne. Uh, Orlando in the title is, is uh, Roland. Roland was the, one of the uh, greatest of Charlemagne's knights or peers. And he, um, in the title, uh, Orlando Furioso, the Furioso refers to him essentially being driven mad by love. It was a continuation of another epic called uh, Orlando Innamorato, or Le uh, Roland in Love. And this one essentially is Roland driven mad by love. Roland isn't in this particular pumpkin. Instead, we have another one of Charlemagne's knights named Bradamante. And Bradamante is special. Uh, particularly because she was a woman knight, which you just don't have all that often. And as knights would do back then, she's off to rescue her lover from an enchanted castle. Only this time the lover is a man, Ruggiero, who's been imprisoned in this enchanted castle high in the Pyrenees. Bradamante decides that she needs to go rescue him. Uh, before she can rescue him, though, she has to defeat the evil wizard, Atalante. This is Atalante here. Uh, who is the wizard who built the castle. And he is a very dangerous adversary for a number of reasons. For one thing, he's a magician and he knows a lot of magic spells. This is his book of magic spells. For another thing, instead of a horse, he rides a hippogriff into battle. And a hippogriff is half horse, half griffin, or essentially an eagle in the front and a horse in the back. And it can fly. So. If you get into a joust with him and it seems like you're getting the upper hand, like you're going to win, he can just jump on his um, hippogriff, fly into the air, and come swooping down on you. And finally, he's got this enchanted shield. You can see it glowing, slung over his shoulder there. Usually he keeps it covered with a black silk cloth. And then at just the right moment in the battle, he pulls the cloth off and these orange rays come darting out of the shield and knock you senseless. So he's a, almost impossible to defeat as an adversary. But Bradamante is not worried about this because she's been talking to the ghost of Merlin who she encountered in a cave in France. And Merlin, having lived backwards, knows everything that's going to happen. And he can tell her exactly how to defeat Atalante. He tells her about a magic ring being carried by a little dwarfish character. And if she can take the ring from him, if she puts it in her mouth, it'll make her invisible. And if she puts it on her hand, you can see that she's got it on her hand here, it protects her against any magic spell that somebody tries to cast on her. So she's gone off to challenge Atalante. And they get into a battle, and they, they fight, and he flies up on the hippogriff, he flies down, and then he gets tired of playing with her and decides to use his magic shield. So he comes toward her, pulls the cloth off the shield, and as soon as she sees the orange rays darting out of the shield, she falls senseless on the ground, or so he thinks. And you can see that she's lying on the ground, and he's creeping toward her with his Book of Magic Spells, trying to figure out which spell to cast on her next. He's getting closer and, th and thinking, well, I've defeated her. She seems to be out cold, I think. And he's starting to um, peer over her. And now if you see her left eye, you can see that she's just playing possum. One of her eyes is open, and she's waiting to see his shadow fall across her. And as soon as she sees that shadow, she knows that he's close enough to grab. She jumps up, grabs him by the neck, throws him down, and takes her sword, and is about to do away with him when he says, Go ahead and kill me. My life is worthless. I'm nothing but an old, broken wizard. But before I die, I want you to know that I love your Ruggiero like a son. And the only reason I've imprisoned him in this castle is to keep him keep him safe from the dangers of the adventures that you would take him on if the two of you ever got married. Because I know from my magic that if he ever marries you, his life will not be a long one. Well, hearing this, Bradamante 
sheathes her sword and she says, well, I won't kill you, but you have to let fate take its course. You have to let Ruggiero out of the castle so that he can marry me because I know that we have a brilliant future together. And so the two of them trudge up to the top of the mountain and Atalante puts one hand on the castle wall, says a magic word, and he and the castle vanish instantaneously, leaving Ruggiero behind at the base of where the castle used to be, blinking in the sunlight, wondering what had happened. And then he sees Bradamante, and they run together, and they fall into each other's arms. And at this point, the story is in great danger of getting to the happily ever after only 300 pages into the book, and you just can't have that. But fortunately, the hippogriff has been left behind, pacing around on the ground, absently cropping the grass. And Ruggiero decides, oh, I really, really want to ride on the hippogriff. And so he swings into the saddle of the hippogriff, not knowing that it's a trap left by Adelante, because as soon as the hippogriff feels Ruggiero's weight on its back, it jumps into the air and flies out into the Atlantic, where there's a magical island that Atalante knows about. So now, Bradamante has to rescue him again, and it's just the beginning of the next cliffhanger in a book that goes on for 1,600 pages of poetry. Now, this is a book that was written in the early 1500s by an Italian named Ludovico Ariosto. This is a portrait of him taken from a painting done by uh, the, the painter Titian. So he's off on this side of the pumpkin telling the story his way by writing the book. And over here, you can see I've carved my hand telling the story my way by carving it onto the pumpkin. The figure of Atalante was basically a a photograph of me that I dressed in a suit of armor. The picture of Bradamante was taken from a statue of Joan of Arc that I learned was in Meridian Hill Park, also known as Malcolm X Park. And this um, castle here in the uh, high in the Pyrenees is from a, a 20th century painting by a painter named Magritte, who I remembered had done a painting the castle of the Pyrenees, so I thought it would be perfect to put that as my castle in the Pyrenees. And the hippogriff, I just spliced together a picture of an eagle and a picture of a horse from a couple of books that I have. It just takes weeks and weeks, because first I have to pick the story. I, every year I try to match the, um, at least the, the um, time and place of the story to the show that the Washington Revels is going to do, and I've been doing that since 1995. This year they're doing a show uh, about Leonardo da Vinci, and so I took a, uh, a poet who was born at about the same time in about the same place, uh, that's uh, Ludovico, and I did an illustration of one of his stories. So I looked around and tried to find something from the Italian Renaissance. And it turned out there was, a, there was a, an Italian epic that was translated from Italian to English for the f very first time by a friend of mine from grad school. And I thought, oh, it would be really neat to do a story that a friend of mine had translated. And I looked at it, I looked at the first volume of it, and I wasn't quite inspired enough. I thought, well, maybe the second volume will have something more exciting. And the bookstore didn't have the second volume of that book. But it did have the first volume of this book, Orlando Furioso. And I thought, hmm, I've heard of this book, but I've never read it. So I opened that up, and it had these exciting stories in it. So then, once I'd found a, uh, a story in, within that book, that seemed to be exciting. It had this orange glowing shield that I thought would look good on a pumpkin. It had a hippogriff that I thought would look nice. And then I started doing sketches, and I was probably doing sketches for, oh, about three weeks, trying to refine them, trying to make them look good. 
And then I needed to have models to get more exact. And so I photographed, I photographed a statue, I photographed uh, uh, myself holding a book, found a picture on the internet of the author, and then it probably took me another week to refine the drawings enough so that I could put them on the pumpkin. Once I had them on the pumpkin, it took about 10 hours to carve it. I've worked out a, a way of doing it that once I have the lines, I can just carve around the lines, and there's not a whole lot of fussing about how, how am I going to carve this, how will I make it look. And then for the last details, uh, for example, the eyeglasses on the, um, on the wizard, or Bradamante's eye, one of them being open, one of them closed. For those, I light the pumpkin up and carve in the dark so that I can see exactly how the picture is going to look on the finished pumpkin. The most important thing is to keep it cold because the mold starts growing in, in a pumpkin that, that gets too warm. And I also use bleach. A very, very dilute solution of bleach kills the mold and doesn't damage the pumpkin. And I'm kind of experimenting with how much bleach I should use or can use before I start bleaching the skin in addition to the mold. It lasts, it's, it's always lasted at least a month. And there was one year, a few years ago, it lasted from October until February. And I could still, I could still display it, though it was starting to um, fall apart a little bit. There was a five-year-old boy who looked at it and picked up the lid and said, Why is the top liquefying? And I thought that was a very impressive thing for a five-year-old to say. But it also told me that this was about the end for that pumpkin. I haven't counted them exactly, but I have been doing it. This is the 40th year. So I've done pumpkins for 40 years, and I only missed one year. I missed the year 1975 in that time made up for it by doing three pumpkins a couple of years, two pumpkins another few years. Usually it's just one pumpkin, because then I kind of run out of energy. The um, best pumpkin I ever got, I got at Butler's Orchard, where I actually went out into the field, found the best pumpkin they had, cut it off the vine, so it was very fresh, so it lasted a long time. Uh, there have been a few times when I got the pumpkin on the way to the Renaissance Fair, they have a kind of a farmer's market. Uh, last year, I found uh, a pumpkin stand near where I work in Virginia. It was a bad year for pumpkins last year. And this was a pumpkin they had to bring all the way from Indiana in order to have one that was big enough, round enough, and smooth enough. This year, and most years, I got it at Country Boy in Glenmont where they, have, they seem to have a nice selection. And I had one um, nice round pumpkin. Unfortunately, it didn't have a stem. But I thought, this is the best I can do. And then I went back, they had another box of pumpkins. And this one was at the top of it. And my eyes got wide when I saw it. For one thing, it has this beautiful stem on top. Gives you a handle for lifting the lid. For another thing, it was very tall. And the design I picked this year, because it has a standing figure and it has a figure lying on the ground, I needed a lot of, of verticality to it. So having a pumpkin that had almost 15 inches of carving area was pretty important. Tools. Uh, the tool I use and have been using for, oh, close to 20 years. It's called a lino zip. It's designed for carving linoleum for making block prints. And you can see it over here. It's a little handle. And then at the tip, you can put in these little, little V-shaped gouges. And you pull it toward you. 
and it cuts a little groove. And the thing that I discovered back in 1970 was the slightest groove that you cut into the pumpkin will enable the light to come through the flesh. So the fact that you can do it with a tiny groove instead of cutting it all the way through means that you can get all the detail you could ever want to put on the pumpkin. Just the way a woodcut artist would be able to get a tremendous amount of detail just scratching the surface of the wood because that gives you the contrast between light and dark. Usually I want to have a few areas that have an accent. For example, his glowing shield, I cut maybe half an inch into the pumpkin. Uh, the face, though, is only maybe a sixteenth of an inch into the, into the pumpkin, with the whites of his eyes maybe a little deeper than that. And then the lights in the distant castle, to make sure that that stands out, I've cut all the way through into the middle of the pumpkin using a drill bit to sort of push through and out. And that gives that accent of a little bit of bright light. But if you have too much, too many areas that are cut all the way through, that's all the eye notices and it will ignore all the detail that I carved into the surface. So I try to use those just as, as little accents. The first year I did this, I used a candle, and it wasn't very bright, but it was bright enough for me to see the future, essentially. And eventually I started using a light bulb, but the problem with most light bulbs is they're so hot. Most of the energy you put into a normal light bulb becomes heat rather than light. Only a little bit of it becomes light. and so. The longer I, I would have the light in it, the closer I had to having pumpkin pie instead of a jack-o'-lantern. And then I found these um, compact fluorescents. And a compact fluorescent puts most of the energy into light instead of heat. So a, um, a light source might only, it might only be as hot as a 20-watt bulb but it might be as bright as a 100 watt bulb. And that's what I've got in here. Uh, I don't know if this is going to throw off your... Uh... But it's, uh, it's a spirally bright compact fluorescent that enables me to leave the pumpkin, it's still maybe an inch thick, and yet the light from that can come through. As long as the room is dark enough for you to see it. 